So welcome to our fourth panel discussion in the series titled Perspectives on a Post-COVID-19 Economy. Today's panel discussion will focus on supply chain and operations. We're excited to have Professor Rachel Chen as our moderator tonight. Professor Chen will introduce the panelists, but before I turn the microphone over to her, I'd like to take a moment to review the rules of engagement for this meeting. So number one, um, you're probably used to hearing this, please keep your microphones muted throughout. The format you can expect today is about the first hour being Professor Chen leading a discussion with the panelists on some in-depth interview questions around their industry. The last half an hour will be allocated to open Q&A. So if you have questions, please post them in the chat feature and make sure you're posting it to everyone. If your question is directed to a particular panelist, please include their name. If it's to both panelists, please include that as well. We want everyone to be comfortable throughout this session. So if you need to take a break at any time, please do so and just make sure that you turn your camera off and stay muted, but do not leave the session. Thank you. So let's get started. Professor Chen. Okay, no, now it's my turn. Uh, welcome everybody. It's so good to see um, everyone in this afternoon. And uh, my name is Richard Chen and I am a faculty here. I taught supply chain management, I taught operations. And I'm so glad to um, kind of reunite with my students <laughs> Uh, and and, and uh, in this panel discussion. So today we have two great panel uh, panel um, speakers today. So um, Peter and has been our uh, MBA student and uh, he graduated in 2016. Uh, Damien uh, and graduated in 2009. So they are all um, great alumni and they are you know contributing to to the DSM. So Peter has been working in various roles in operations and supply chain management and. Uh, Right now, he is the director of operations in Sonoma uh, Brands, and he will talk about some of the challenges they face when during this COVID-19. Um, Damien has been working in the wine industry, and right now he is the vice president and of the supply chain of the Chichero, Chichero family estates. I hope I pronounced the name correct. So uh, it's so great to have both of you. Uh, welcome to the um, um, panel discussion. Okay. So I haven't, actually, I haven't seen them after they uh, graduated from GSM. So it's good to, to see you again. Okay. Okay. So um, we will have the uh, two parts of the uh, meeting. So the first part of the meeting, we will, um, I will raise a number of questions. So I guess the, the questions I'm mostly curious about is how has the COVID-19 virus affect your industry so far? Um, how has the uh, virus created uh, particular challenges on your job, either you know, I, uh, as the uh, manager or the uh, vice, uh, vice president of, of the supply chain? So um, I guess you guys probably will answer those questions, um, take turns, and then whoever wants to go um, first. And Peter, do you want to go ahead? And how does COVID-19 affect your industry so far? Peter, you are missing. Okay. Uh, there you go. Uh, yeah, I can go first. So, uh, you know, my specialty is, is startup companies, growth companies. And, and so COVID has hit the startup uh, CPG companies very hard. And what I mean by that is that in initial stages, uh, you know, demand, uh, demand changed, uh, consumer behavior changed. And our ability to recognize revenue in, in different different channels has changed. And why that's difficult for startup companies is that we're highly uh, reliant on cash in the, in the beginning stages. And so it, it, uh, it, it's caused a lot of uh, startup companies to focus specifically on cash and their cash position and protecting that at all costs uh, in order to gain the runway, uh, you reduce cash burn, uh, to survive this, this uh, you know, this crisis. And so companies that, that have a poor cash position will have to seek fundraising in a down round. Uh, capital is more costly and it's more scarce. Uh, investors, private equity investors are, are uh, risk averse at this point in time. 
and they're looking for great deals and re a reduction of their risk. And so what, what could happen uh, to small and medium companies at this time is that they can't either find funding or funding is so expensive that they have to give away a large portion of their equity. Uh, and so a lot, a lot of these growth companies have had to figure out how to reduce cash burn, uh, how to reposition their brands in a more effective way, how to uh, have targeted marketing spends and, and targeted innovation that actually captures what the consumers are doing. Uh, and so it's forced a, 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 a more refined strategy uh, and then to wait out uh, this time period until the consumer de uh, demand uh, requirements have been solidified. And uh, so that's essentially what has been happening. Um, for us at, at, at Sonoma Brands, we've been focusing more on direct to consumer. We've seen the consumer brands switch to Instacart for grocery shopping. They have gone to mass stores more readily uh, than grocery and they've been buying snacks online. They've also been doing a lot of baking. So a lot of, a lot of the baking sets, uh, you know, marshmallows, dip product or dip marshmallows in the baking sets have, have been selling more or so than uh, in the uh, traditional candy sets. So it's been very interesting. And uh, we've, we've figured out the consumer behavior and we've pivoted uh, quickly. And so we're gaining the rewards of that. So that's a little, little background, a little context on what we're dealing with. So you are saying like on the consumer side, they basically, they are still eating and consuming the products just like right. they're buying from different channels. And you have to reallocate your resources so that the food and, and, and the product is sold through a different channel now. Correct. So simply put, consumers are still buying. Uh, they're still buying, but how they're buying is different. And, and so and that's the greatest challenge that, that uh, we're focusing on is, one, providing a product that consumers want to buy in a crisis. And then two, where are they buying their snacks now? If they're not buying it at grocery. If they're not buying it at sea stores. Where are they buying it? Um, and so... I mean, it's taken, you know, a large amount of humility and also curiosity to figure that out and then to be nimble enough to pivot uh, as a, as a, you know, as we figured out the consumer behavior in this crisis. I see. So thank you. So Damien, you have something to share about the wine. I think people are still drinking, probably drink even more. So do you have to redirect <laughs> the distribution channel? Yeah, we hope so, and thanks for um, everyone's support. And I, I like how Peter kind of set up, um, you know, sort of the work environment being a startup one, and, and I think it's really great that you, you have both of us as panelists because I think as we get into this, um, it'll be interesting the types of questions that we get and to compare and contrast um, some of our businesses as well as the, the supply chains that we have. So Trincaro Family Estates is the second largest winery in the United States. It's, um, it's been around for about 75 years. And um, uh, about 75 different brands, billion dollars of revenue. We ship around 20 million cases a year. Um, so as Professor Chen had pointed out, um, my, my role is to run the supply chain here. And, and what that entails is supply planning, demand planning, direct and indirect procurement, co-manufacturing, and global customer service and logistics. So, you know, within that scope, um, this has been, this has been a, a process that sort of emerged over a period of time, and, and we did start to see um, some things percolating in, in our supply base, particularly in, in Asia, but it was, a, it was a matter of, you know, to what extent we wanted to recognize that something was going on um, within our business. And then, of course, we, we all know what sort of manifested itself uh, at a later point. So specifically for our industry and, and for our business, you know, from, from the early days, um, we, we were really just trying to get a sense of, of what the heck was going on. And I was chatting with um, Peter and Professor Chen just yesterday about it is we, we definitely pointed our supply chain in a direction uh, day one and we were trying to be very proactive and ramp up um, our, our production engine but 
Uh, we got lucky in some cases, and in other cases, we pointed it completely the, the wrong direction. Uh, but what we knew in, in an effort to mitigate risk, uh, knowing that we could be shut down, some of the businesses that we depend on uh, could be shut down, is, is we started to ramp up in order to convert into finished goods. Um, so, you know, our focus was there uh, in lieu of a real signal and uh, a real signal of the wild demand fluctuations. Um, we, we'd find out more, you know, as it was, was history and then, and then re-aim. But uh, again, in the early days, we're just trying to get people um, out of the building, get them in a safe place, reset our operations, um, try to keep our operations going and um, keep each one of our, our colleagues you know, safe in, in their new work environment. We also set up a number of contingency plans. Um, I had bad branding in retrospect, but um, our contingency plan, you know, we, we called it kind of the designated survivor model. They're, they're current key positions where our, our business literally, you know, shuts down if you can't take orders or ship product. So um, we started to sort of segregate um, some of the personnel in an effort to have sort of contingency plan A, B, and C in, in the event um, that we had an event inside of our, our own organization. Um, and, and then, you know, of course, immediately uh, went and identified risk across our supply base as well as our customer base where, um, you know, some are, are more critical than others. And so we, we really determined that quickly and um, made sure that we were talking at the right level and at the right frequency within each one of those organizations. In terms of um, some of the, the channel activity that we saw going on and has you know, persisted over this time period, in terms of on-premise, and for um, some of you that may not be familiar with that term, on-premise, on all that really means is um, you're, you're going to a, a location to consume our, our products, so you know, bars, um, restaurants, even even concerts can be considered to be on-premise occasions, and um, this this channel literally is nosedived and still hasn't really come back. Um, so you can maybe imagine some of the challenges associated with that um, in terms of obsolescence, and then from a longer-term view, just knowing that you know, look, small businesses go out of business every day, but there's the reality of um, there, there were probably some pretty healthy on-premise businesses that um, are, are just not going to be there when all the dust settles. So there's going to be a business for um, our, our sales staff to, to really rebuild. So we've got sort of an obsolescence challenge and uh, literally a, a, a top line uh, challenge that we have to work through over a period of time, including all of the fine wine that's pent up in that supply chain because Oftentimes, in the on-premise environment, you, you have brands that are specifically targeted uh, for, for that environment as opposed to um, what I'll get to next is, is the off-premise. So off-premise is, is sort of the completely different story because, um, as, as you know, everyone's going to find a way to drink. And so that, that mechanism has been through um, off-premise. And off-premise is, is really... Um, you know, your grocery stores and such where you go and, and uh, you know, buy it at the scanner, if you will. And for us, this has been a really big boon um, because what I'll say is that it's, it's a large percentage of our business. Um, we have strong brands that uh, people recognize and, and enjoy. And, and in a time of uncertainty, um, aside from people trying to, you know, buy econom economical sizes, they're also looking for some stability and, and um, you know, human nature is to go find something that you're familiar with and, and uh, is, is predictable. So we've, we've got brands that kind of fit that bill and we've seen a significant lift in, in our off-premise business. And to a large extent in, in that space, we've been chasing demand uh, quite literally. And, um, you, you know, we, we've had our, our share of challenges. So, you know, you, you can look at uh, the, the customer. Um, I, I remember we got a call from, from Safeway and said, hey, we know we've got 50,000 cases on order, but yeah, let's, uh, let's put the shipments on hold. And then that night, of course, we see on Channel 7 that uh, the Tracy Distribution Center has been shut down and they, they've got, you know, um, a big situation going on there. 
And when these incidents happen, they, they tend to come like a thief in the night. And um, from what I could tell, they last a couple weeks before sort of business can resume. Within our own organization, we, we had some uh, precautionary shutdowns, but we've never really had a big incident. But um, within our own operations, what, what we've done and in an effort to really um, respect the fact that a lot of our colleagues are managing a lot of different things. You know, they're being teachers and, you know, just everyone's uh, doing their best. So we instituted um, a, a sort of mandate to not do any overtime. Well, from a supply chain professional standpoint, that means that our capacity just went down and we um, are going to have trouble finding that pedal to chase demand. So that, um, in addition to some of our suppliers um, having their own incidents, it really became an issue as, as well. So we're still chasing um, glass containers. That's, that's been really one of our biggest challenges because a couple of um, the largest manufacturers in, in the world um, have, have had incidents in plants that we, you know, depend on. So, you know, you can have really great wine sitting in a tank or a barrel, but unless you can put it in a container, it's, <laughs> it's going to be problematic. So, I mean, it's just um, um, an interesting time in that regard. And then I, I think the other channel that I would just briefly touch on is, is sort of that e-commerce um, channel. And, you know, that's, got some I, I think some sub components to it because you know you can you can go to literally the the winery you can go through your retailer or um, some of these other you know platforms like drizzly and, and such but in any event across the board we, we've seen very big lift in in that and so you know our industry has been no exception in that regard and uh, what from what I could tell is going on is you know, um, I, I think a lot of us were just sort of on the fence in terms of how we went and procured alcohol, and um, this this event has, has really been the, the, the kick in the tail that a lot of people needed to, I, I'd say, download that app or, or find that alternative way uh, to have that delivery mechanism. And, you know, time will tell if they, they like that as a delivery mechanism, but for all intents and purposes, we've seen... Um, you know, very big lift in, in that in that environment. Okay, thank you. So I'm I'm really curious. So you're saying you're facing some of the challenges by uh, working with the online channels. So, uh, like, uh, I mean, what kind of what kind of methods do you do, like logistics wise? And do you send it directly to consumers, or do you still go through some retailers? Uh, it's all the above. I, I think the internal challenge for the e-commerce component is, is really just been scaling our, our operation um, because it's, it's grown, you know, I, I'd say by factor of like 4X. So um, we, we want to, you know, maintain sort of our same uh, service level agreement with the, the customers, uh, especially the incremental ones that, that just tried us. And so uh, given some of the labor constraints that we put on ourselves and, and really it's in an effort to make sure people are safe and to respect each and every colleague for what they may be up against um, when they leave work. That's, that's been a balancing act, but I, I think what's been great is because um, unfortunately some of our tasting rooms are shut down, we've been able to be creative with how we move labor resources around in, in an effort to really meet the challenge. Okay. Yeah, so I want to also direct this question to Peter. So for Peter, you also mentioned that you are moving a lot of the stream channel to online. And what is the biggest challenge you face when you are, you know, you said you re re uh, redirect your resources. And what is the what is the most difficult part of this, doing this? I think the most difficult part was to realize the, the actual shift in consumer behavior. Uh, so most of our business uh, was in other channels, you know, basically mass, uh, sea store, or grocery. And we saw a significant bump in uh, Amazon sales and then e-commerce sales on our, on our uh, company platform, Smashmallow. Uh -huh. and, and once we saw 
a, a, a change in consumer behavior, we, we took certain steps to support that uh, as we were dealing with the inconsistency of buying patterns from the retail stores. Uh, and so what we did is we did a strategic uh, shift in our, our uh, spending pattern, especially on marketing, to target our, our direct consu to, uh, consumer, focusing more ads on Instagram, Facebook, Google, uh, to support the e-commerce uh, craze, if you call it. Uh, yeah, and, and, and we still have that concerted effort. Uh, but now, as of you know, the last couple of weeks, we're starting to see more consistency on the retail buying uh, section. So although Amazon is increasing, I mean, we've got a 45% vector on Amazon growth, which is, in, which is uh, really great. Uh, we're noticing, you know, mass is growing as well. So we're supporting that with marketing spends. Uh, grocery is now starting to come along. Uh, and that's a good sign for confidence in the market. Uh, resets. Uh, so if anybody doesn't know what a reset is, is, is when you, uh, there are opportunities every year uh, to gain access and position on shelf in certain retailers like Kroger, uh, Fred Myers, uh, you know, Harris Teeters, you name it, Raley's. Uh, and they'll, the, the store will, will essentially reset their programming and reset their shelf space and allow new entrants with the uh, potential to, to, to provide profitability to that grocery store uh, to, to gain uh, placement. Uh, b during the, the initial stages of the COVID crisis, most, if not all retailers, placed a pause or a moratorium on resets. So if you had planned growth and planned spend on either innovation or increase in production to support it, you had to place that on hold, scrap your plan and start over. Uh, and now we're seeing a resurgence in that, which is great for the economy, great for the consumer, and then obviously great for Smash Bob. I see, great, thank you. So um, I have another question is that, um, uh, is that like you talk on uh, so far talk more about the distribution side like you recognize consumers still eating and drinking so actually i think by doing this quarantine people are eating and drinking more uh and uh, i ask my students do they do more with grocery shopping or less they say they do more because everyone is staying at home and everybody is eating so seems like business is, is good you just need to rep reposition how you uh, send the product to the consumers then I'm very curious about the supply side. Like say, uh, do you see a lot of disruption to, uh, from the supply side? Like, uh, do you have a good um, collaboration with your suppliers? Uh, and uh, do you feel like there is a risk that, that in the supply chain for like not getting the food or delivery or whatever supply material from your suppliers? So I'll start with uh, Peter. Uh, so, so far we have uh, had no risk uh, to our supply chain. We get uh, weekly reports on the risk assessment. Um, they either, you know, highlight whether they've had cases at the plant or not at all. Uh, they assess the risk of, of, you know, the government risk, uh, you know, the, the manufacturing risk, you name it, multiple categories. And every week they provide a, a, uh, an assessment on where they stand. And so far, all of our manufacturers, they're very professional, best in class, SQF and BRC qualified uh, with the highest food safety standards. Uh, they have all been operational. And another, another interesting fact about our supply chain is that our, all of our logistic nodes have been fully operational. And that's a great credit to all the logistics companies out there and the truckers who move our product, that they're still able to feed America during one of the most devastating crises that we've seen in the last decade. Great. So how, how about you? How about the wine suppliers, Damien? Yeah, as I said, I mean, it's been, it's been challenging at times. Um, but I, I think, you know, to Peter's point, we've been really fortunate to the extent that people have really been able to keep things together. And like I mentioned earlier, um, 
uh, out of out of Asia, we were starting to see some risk percolate, and a lot of that had to do with the timing of deliveries coming out of there. And, and, and in that case, um, it was really driven by some uh, point of sale sort of uh, you know media that was that was coming out of there, and eventually we delivered to stores uh, for for the resets and uh, promotions that that Peter was speaking to earlier. Um, and then, and then a little bit later on, we, we started to see goods really slow down out of Europe. So that's both dry goods as well as some of the um, international you know wineries that we we help distribute product for. And and you know throughout this global pandemic, I would say it's been um, amazing just how uh, global logistics largely is is stayed intact so in spite of all the shutdowns and these things um, goods have continued to move it, it's just at a slightly slower pace so you know as a supply chain professional uh, what you start doing is you you stock up uh, and you you start um, you know working the the buffer or suffer sort of angle and so that you know that was something that we recognized early on and uh, why I would say as I mentioned before, we even knew which way to run. We we just uh, knew that we were probably um, uh, on the clock, and and you know we wanted to ramp up our production engine uh, because we we literally didn't know what next the next day or the next week might look like. You know, one thing I was reflecting on um, as as we start talking about this call is what what's been interesting for me is I, I think. Um, uh, the, the fire season the last several years is, is helped us prepare in some strange way for um, sudden changes and, and having to adapt. Um, you know, so this is this is similar, just different. And I think what what's been different is we we kind of saw this one coming, where where the fires just suddenly happened, and um, I, I think you know our, our supply chain and, and the professionals that. I'm charged with leading. They they just really got into almost fire season mode, and and really stepped up and, and started to reach out to our supply base and customer base. So you know I shared some of the challenges along the way, but uh, what what was interesting is as we started looking at you know I, I'd say there's you know 30 main suppliers that could just take us down any moment, but you know. Full full scope. There's there's probably over 100 to 150 different suppliers we we directly reached out to um, when when things really started to happen. So we just kind of divided and, and conquered. But um, what what I found to be most interesting is we had a couple of suppliers literally um, uh, preparing to shut down. So we we had a capsule supplier and, and we're single threaded. With, with that one or um, put it in supply chain terms so we're, we're so sourced with them so we're that means we're highly dependent on them and so <laughs> they said yeah you know we're, we're shutting down on this day and so we we literally had to start sending them um, information from the government we sent them um, uh, notifications on company letterhead saying you know we're an essential business and by extension of that uh, you need to stay open, and, and so um, there. There were just some interesting times uh, throughout. So I, I don't want to act like it. You know, it's it's sort of like a soap opera, and, and things change every day. But it's it's been um, you know truly challenging um, and, and rewarding at the same time because the team's got to really come together, and and you start to understand the, the strength in your relationships with suppliers and customers because, you know, some of the systems stuff we do and and the administrative things like, you know, POs and contracts, that, that's all great. But if you can't pick up the phone and call someone that can mobilize their organization, then you, you might be missing an opportunity. This, this is a fantastic view. I really like it because, um, the relationship people build with their suppliers and their clients are very, very valuable. So sometimes we cannot really count on, you know, those hard like a contract, oh, you say, oh, this is written on a piece of paper, you are supposed to go this or this. 
a lot of times it's 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 based on the relationship the trust people have built on and uh, over the time and then that really works in this uh in, in, in challenging time and a very very interesting thing you talk about is that now the supply chain is more prepared because of the, the fire season we had for the past few uh, for the past um, past few years so it seems like uh, right. the supply chain is now more resistant to risks and uh, to and a lot of the random events happened to to affect the the um, supply chain yeah Okay. Yeah, I, I would just add that, you know, in reality, um, I, and I don't want to downplay some of the administrative things we do as professionals, um, particularly in, in the procurement space, but, you know, there's, there's these two magic words that that's, uh, you, you see more and more these days is force majeure. And, you know, at, at that point, all bets are off and you're, you're, having to really focus on uh, relationships and the ability to influence people within another organization that are you're you're interdependent with uh, to to move in a direction yeah that, that that's very nice to, to to share okay so um i have on uh, another question i have is like I oftentimes I had students who are like currently MBA students they ask me that they are interested in going into uh, you know the supply chain on all operations and that they are interested to know what kind of like analytical or management skills like you guys are looking for supposed that that I mean you guys are uh, right now at the management position and then you look at the uh, future like uh, interviews or whatever what kind of tools they uh, or or skills that you think it's vital for them to you know develop themselves to the career in supply chain management so I'll start with uh, Peter again. Okay, yeah, so when I, when I look at candidates or I hire people, um, I have a different philosophy than most. Uh, I'm looking for attitude. I'm looking for fit of culture. Uh, and so, at, you know, attitude is tough to learn, right? Skills you can train and you can, you can train them well or train them to, to the, the company and the, the philosophy of the company. Uh, attitude is very, very important. You know, you need to be a team player. You need to understand concepts like ownership. What do I mean by ownership? You know, do you, can you take charge of a project or a task and be responsible for the success or failure of that task? If that's a yes, then we want you. Perseverance. We're in a startup environment. Uh, if you don't know how to fail, and failing's common in the entrepreneurship world, it's, uh, entrepreneurship is more glamorized. You see a lot of the successes, but what you don't see is the grit and determination it takes uh, to win. And what we need are people who can fail, get up, change course, and then move with a passion in a new direction. Uh, if you have those skills, then we want you. You need to be dependent. And what I mean by that is simply do what you say you're going to do, do it well, and then do it on time. And we have a, we have a philosophy here that the market does not wait. That they don't, they don't, the market does not care if you show up late with a inferior product. At bottom line, it won't sell or it won't work. And so you need to be dependent. Um, last one is humility. And what I, what I mean by that, and I may be stealing a quote from somebody else, but it, it's the self knowing that one simply doesn't know. And what I mean by that, and you can say it in a different way is just having the courage to be curious, constantly asking questions. Is my strategy right? Is my tactic right? Or is my method right? And constantly reassessing. And that set us up for success in this COVID crisis. You know, we could have, an example of that, we could have just continued uh, to focus on grocery and mass and C stores and completely miss the buying behavior change to online. And uh, that curiosity set us up to, to quickly change and take advantage of that. As for hard skills, I mean, we're looking for uh, three to five years of experience in the known startup or strategic C CPG brand, either you know, uh, managing manufacturing plants, running logistics, 
or if you're in the R&D uh, quality assurance space, uh, MS and food science, uh, and experience in that. And then we also love quants. We love quant savvy individuals and who can think independently. And so that's what, that's what I'm looking for in a, in a candidate. Great. That's very good to hear. So, so, so uh, it sounds like uh, some students ask me like if they don't have any working experience in operations management, they, they want to switch career into this. You think that is uh, okay as long as they are willing to learn, they can learn quick, quickly, right? I, I assume that Correct. is your answer. Correct. Correct. Great attitude, willing to learn, and willing to put in the hard work it takes to succeed in a startup. Okay, very glad to hear. Okay, Damien, I want to switch over to see what do you think. Any, any thoughts about what you? Yeah, looking? hey, I, I got to say ditto on a lot of the stuff Peter mentioned. Uh, one one thing that sort of uh, resonated with me is there's there's uh, this thing out there, and and if you guys haven't seen, it's just called the accountability ladder. But I keep it in front of my team a lot, and and I got to say that when I'm looking for candidates, um, I, I look for a lot of the characteristics that. Peter just mentioned because it's all about do things happen to you or do you make things happen? And so when you have high accountability, uh, you, you have characteristics where you're, you're willing to do the work, um, you, you've got the grit and the ownership level, as, as Peter pointed out, you know, in terms of sort of, and you, you, can't, you can't train that, um, is, is my view. Um, so. So I, I would agree with Peter. Uh, I'm looking for um, certain characteristics straight out in, in any candidate for um, just about any position. But I, I'd say in general, um, what I look for in, in supply chain candidates is, is people that I could project doing more. Um, so I could see them, you know, being promoted into a couple of different roles or, or even working, um, you know, laterally across the organization in different roles. And, and I like to see in their professional experience or some of the attributes that they're, they're willing to see the big picture and, and think about things as, as sort of a bigger, um, you know, ecosystem. They're more concerned with how things work together than uh, just, you know, sort of their department or, or just, you know, not someone that necessarily is, is narrow in, in thinking. So um, project management skills, cross-functional um, track record and, and ability to, you know, give examples on that I, I think are critically important. Um, a little bit more supply chain related, I'd say. I, I'd like to see candidates that, um, you know, run to the customer. So, it's all about how do you deliver value to the customer and, and supply chain. Um, so they don't necessarily need to have, um, you know, direct customer management uh, in, in their past, but there has to be something about them that is customer centric because, you know, the reason why we, we do all this stuff is, is to, at the end of the day, deliver something that the consumer wants or our direct customer wants. And um, if that doesn't click, then that's, that's a red flag from, from my perspective anyway. And um, I, I'd say lastly, and I think this is going to become more and more important, is, is sort of that strategic mindset. So, you know, gone are the days, uh, at least I hope, where we're just buying stuff. Um, and and uh, I think now we're, we're getting to a point where is to say, okay, what's, what's the competitive landscape within this uh, category? And, and sure, we're in the wine business, but we need to know a heck of a lot about glass or some of the other things that our business is dependent on. And then you, you start to kind of uh, determine, you know, how do we want to go about that? What's, what's important to us? Is, is price important to us or is it, is it really uh, low risk level and we're willing to pay more? So, you know, that's, that's a lot to unpack there because there's a number of attributes, but it's unpacking those, articulating them, uh, looking at the landscape in, in the, the humility, um, as, as Peter pointed out, to go back uh, inside of the organization and walk stakeholders through, um, you know, kind of what you're seeing and what you're recommending 
so that you can take that and what you own and and deliver on it. So um, those are those are some of the things that I would add. But I, I thought Peter had a really spot on sort of uh, response to to your question. Yes, yes. I mean, both of you guys have contributed very well. I mean, I, 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 now I have very good answers to, to the students about those and they don't have to worry about their background. And what's more important is about the attitude and willingness to, to learn and be responsible and take the initiative. I guess those are the most uh, important factors for success. Um, so looking forward, I mean, it, when we look at, I mean, hopefully this, um, we will have the vaccine developed within a year. And then uh, what do you look at the future uh, do you feel like there will be significant changes after the COVID-19? Do we move more on the line? Do we move more everything online? Do we have more like a, a digitization of like even selling to consumers or dealing with clients or dealing with suppliers? Do you expect something like that? So um, I'll go with Damien this time first. Yeah. It, so you were a little bit underwater when you were asking the question, um, but I, I think you were touching on you know how how are things going to change as we as we get out of this crisis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah hey, I, I, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, of course, you know the digitization thing is is going to continue. And, and as I said, I, I think there's been um, some things that have really um, motivated consumers to move in that direction. I, I got to tell you, from um, sort of a, a uh, supply chain standpoint, particularly on the, the planning um, and, and sourcing and making components of, of supply chain, we, we've really noticed that our, our systems are just not sufficient. So um, we, we knew that going into the event and it, it um, was a barrier, but it, it really um, became a challenge to where we had this dynamic thing, a fluid situation, and as variables changed, um, you know, at times we go, oh my gosh, our, this part of our system doesn't allow us to, you know, take a, a demand expectation and convert it into an integrated supply plan uh, across multiple entities. Um, how do we do trade-offs when it takes three days to work through all the Excel spreadsheets to determine what they even are. Um, so I think systems are, are going to be critically important for anyone with a supply chain. And, and I could say that, um, you know, that's, that's definitely something that we, we have to work on and drastically improve in, inside of our organization. I, I think, um, you know, maybe this isn't appropriate for after uh, the COVID-19, but what I would say and, and what, I, what I hope um, is, is a condition that persists is to get away from some of the fluff uh, that we were doing before. So I, I, I'd say that, um, you know, it's really forced the issue for my leadership team to work uh, more closely with one another and understand each other's jobs and how they, they do need each other. But I've also seen um, re relationships with other departments drastically change. So, um, you know, I, I would say that supply chain's relationship with, with sales has drastically improved. And, you know, we would be in a lot of different cross-functional meetings uh, pre-COVID and, you know, you've got all the different forms and the different strategies. And um, when, when a lot of this hit, it, it literally just turned into, hey, I got to talk to the head of sales every day just so we can compare notes and be aligned, and then we'll go do whatever that is. And, and um, I like that. I, I don't know that it's you know, going to be the right way to build a strategy, but I, I think um, coming out of the COVID crisis, we have to find a way to sort of um, not, not kind of uh, sink back into our old methods of, of running the, the corporation and, and uh, you know, governing our, our strategy. So um, I, I'm hoping for a rebalance in that regard. So, so you see more like integrated uh, within the company. Like I remember usually when I uh, teach operations to students, I say like, you know, operations people usually hate marketing people. 
because the marketing people keep promising and operations people say, I can't deliver because we have finite capacity. So there usually there will be a conflict between those two types of roles. And you are saying like now they are more, they are communicating with each other more, they are more integrated. So it's more a smooth collaboration kind of within the company. And you hope this will continue even after the COVID-19. Yeah, and, and look, you know, we, we've had to test the system at times where, um, so, so it's all great, um, but, but we've actually had to pressure test it at times where, you know, the conversation um, prior to, to COVID-19 was, um, is, is this, you know, what length should this capsule be? What are the 10 different shades of red? And how does, how does the, it look in the lighting of a, you know, grocery environment? Let's do a study on that. Um, to really just getting to the point of, hey, can you sell this without capsules? Or um, can you just be happy to have capsules and you have the person that's selling the product going, yep, I'll take one of those. Let's move on to the next challenge. So um, I, I just think that there's, there's some rebalancing there and, and some calibration that's, that's occurred, you know, across um, probably most entities. And I, I think there's, there's got to be a concerted effort um, to, to sort of continue to ride that wave, the, the good parts of it, um, and, and to readjust. So it sounds like the risk or the challenges actually bring people closer to each other and, and, then, and, and then create some type of bonding among the different sort of function uh, departments and then that actually will uh, bring more benefits to, to the organization. Yeah? Absolutely. So, yeah, and, and that, that's very good to know. So, so that's why I always make my exam hard. <laughs> So all the MBA students will create that very long lasting bond and they remember that they suffer together. So um, yeah. Peter, so I, I, do you want to comment on like, how do you think, uh, you know, the things will be different after COVID-19, especially like digital, uh, digitization of the uh, economy uh, after COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, so we look at it two ways. I mean, obviously consumer behavior is huge for us and so uh, we look at consumer behavior, and the big question is, is will that change again? How entrenched are the consumers in their methods right now versus in a year, six months, year? And, and, and try to predict whether or not they're going to be con uh, entrenched on online or they're going to uh, you know, reduce their online presence and move back into the grocery store or do a hybrid of the two. So that's a big question that needs to be answered. Um, you know, and with analyzing more data over time, we'll, we'll, we'll finally understand whether they're going to be entrenched online or do a blend of both. I don't think it's going to move back to the way it was. I think there's going to be some sort of, of okay. online presence in a big way in the future. Um, now, st strategy changes as well. So. When you're in the middle of a crisis, you have to reassess fundamentally your strategy. If you keep the same strategy in a time of crisis, you'll probably fail. And so we had to take a hard look at what was our end state during this crisis? What did success look like? And for us, we determined that, you know, it may not be about growth right now. It may be about cash preservation. So when you switch strategies like that, then you can implement tactics that make sense. A tactic on growth doesn't necessarily work on tactic on cash, cash preservation. And so then you have to re-identify tactics and uh, measurable goals that you're trying to meet to support that strategy. And so it's a, essentially a complete overhaul when you're in a crisis. And so some of the stuff that, that Damien was alluding to on how teams work and and what's working and what's not has to be completely re-understood, redefined, and and you know and and practiced well. Um, you know, we we looked at everything from you know skew rationalization, you know, reduction in inventory levels, uh, optimization, targeted marketing spend, targeted innovation. Uh, you know, how how do we sell? How do we get our product to consumers? All that had to be re-evaluated on whether or not it would be successful and I within once we get a, a better understanding of 
how consumers behave in the next six months, we will reshift our strategy to growth. Uh, and, and so, and then that will then again, move tactics support that, that, uh, that strategy. And so it's a pretty, pretty interesting times. And, the, and I have to reiterate this, the companies that do not do this are the companies that will not make it. Uh, and so, yeah, and you have to have the humility to understand that, or at least ask the question. So, so, so I, I, do you think this is more has something more to do with the um, product? I mean, or the category your company belongs because you are working in like the startups, and then you have to reposition or adjust to the environment quickly all the time, re-examine your strategy all the time. So, uh, well, so startups are nimble enough to do that, and it, and the, the strategy we're taking is 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 not necessarily dr as dramatic as I'm posing it. You know, it, it's just a, it's just a, uh, a, a concentrated okay. shift on the method you're using uh, to, to get an end result, right? And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, and again, so um, where are you spending your money? How lean is your team? How are they integrating? Uh, you know, can they be successful in a growth mindset uh, in the future? Um, you know, so that all these questions were asked, we answered them in our way, and we developed tactics to support it. Um, and I believe we'll be uh, in a better foundation coming out of this uh, than other companies will be. If that makes sense. Okay, so so it seems like uh, uh, you are uh, fully aware of the impact. So. Do you have a sense of, I mean, when you look at the strategy of your company, do you have a sense of how your competitors are doing? Have you heard stories about the competitors that are facing very significant challenges during this COVID-19? So let me, yeah, let me be clear. Uh, a lot of CPG startup companies are uh -huh. in a very bad position right now. Oh, okay. So That's this, I mean, so there are, there are numerous companies that have are in a poor cash position that have to raise in a down valuation. If, I, if, if, and please ask questions about that if, if people don't understand what I'm talking about. But you're forced to take on cash in not ideal situations. Now there's there's a uh, greener pasture at the end of this, right? Mm -hmm. So as companies start to to fail or have to uh, engage in uh, M and A's or 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 uh, gain funding and a down valuation, uh, that creates limited options on the upside. So when you're, when you're looking, if you're a strategic company like Pepsi, Mars, Mondelez, Hershey, you name it, there are gonna be fewer options for growth potential in 2021. Uh, and then they will have to reach down and pick up companies at, the, at, at, a, uh, at a more, uh, not mature, uh, you know, so it, what, what, what I mean by that, they're going to have to reach down to companies that are a hundred million and less uh, and pay more for that uh, than traditional multiples uh, because they're more limited options and competitions are scarce and there are going to be few uh, premium brands for them to, to buy and uh, for a potential growth uh, vector on their end, if that makes sense. So the, 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 the M&A market, the funding market has completely and utterly changed due to, to, to the COVID crisis. Right now there's down valuations, but in 2021, the scarcity of growth acquisitions is gonna cause a overvaluation in 2021. That, that makes sense. Yeah, that, that's very good to know. It, it's, thank, thank you so much for this, for this insight. So, so Damien, what do you think? You think the uh, this uh, your competitors? Uh, I mean, how do they survive? Do you have do you have a sense like how your competitors are surviving in this pandemic? Yes. And and and, and everyone's suffering. Yeah, I, I don't know um, how much I I have to share, but I, I think that. Um, they're going through a lot of the same challenges um, within their own organization mm -hmm. and um, I, I think that as, as you look at the different channels in which some um, winery competitors you know sell in 
it, it's it's sort of starts to shape the story. So, as an example, a, a company that um, maybe looks like ours would have similar challenges, um, but but maybe a company that looks like ours uh, in, in size has a larger percentage of their business on premise. As an example, well that. That has sort of a different impact to, you know, the ripple effect within their supply chain and their ability to sort of balance out revenue and contribution. Um, you know, similarly, it just across the the alcohol um, space, um, you know, a lot of spirits they're they're really consumed um, on premise. So a lot of the spirits kind of stream to bars and and whatnot. So Distributors, um, you know, are, are sitting on a tremendous amount of high-value inventory, um, just and, and the suppliers are as well. And some of the some of the accounts that may or may not be in business when this all ends, you know. So so a spirits company has slightly different challenges. Um, you know, some of you guys may have seen in the news some of the challenges that uh, the, the beer guys are having. So there's there's a tremendous amount of kegs out there that are becoming obsolete and, and so you know that's that's a problem uh, that that liquid is you know pun intended going to have to be liquidated so in, in the wine industry there there are such things as wine kegs but even even the really big players it, it's a fairly limited uh, amount um, of, of keg exposure i would imagine um, but yeah, in terms of you know talking in depth uh, around some of our, our specific competitors, um, not really prepared to do that this this evening. But um, they, I, I would say that based off of my basic understanding, they're experiencing a lot of the same challenges when it comes to planning, sourcing, and making and delivering to customers. So it sounds to me like it seems like a crisis is a crisis, but a crisis can also be an opportunity for some of the companies. I mean, it could be a disaster or uh, really disruptive for some business, but could also be an opportunity that some business can actually quickly grow and expand during this uh, uh, challenge time. Those people who Absolutely. are more prepared or who are, are reacting faster and they are able to take an advantage of this uh, challenging time, actually. Absolutely correct. Oh, that's so interesting to know. Wow. I, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, so now it, we're close to six o'clock. I think we should open up for uh, questions from audience. And uh, as Asia uh, mentioned earlier, so the questions, uh, it's better to submit it to uh, the chat window. And when you submit your chat window, please make sure you and send it to everyone, otherwise I cannot see it because I am not a host. So send it to everyone. And, uh, and, and if you want Peter or Damien to answer those questions, please you know, put their names before the questions. So I guess that's, um, Asia, is that right, the format? Okay, yeah, so we are open up for questions and then students are welcome to um, ask. Peter and I can ask each other questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so one, one question I have is, I mean, my students always ask me, is that the career path? So if you, if you look back, what makes you get into this supply chain industry and how did you see yourself grow over time to collect some of the, you know, experience or, or components so that you get to the management position? That's, that's something I'm curious about because for students who are interested in operations or supply chain management, they want to know what is the how do they plan their career ahead of time? So I like to start with Damien. So over the time, how did, <laughs> what did you get into operations? How did you become? I mean, when you graduated from GSM, did you already make up your mind to become a uh, you know in supply chain industry? Uh, yeah, I think I was I was really starting to get there at that time, but. But honestly, um, I'm probably the worst example. I, I don't know how the heck I ended up in supply chain. Um, so I, what I'd say is just hearkening back to even my undergraduate uh, years, which, which I also went to Davis uh, for that too, and uh, studied agriculture and manager economics, but um, never set out to work in supply chain. Um, I, I would say that I, I grew up in operations 
And what I mean by that is I grew up on a dairy and beef cattle ranch, and um, I, I learned how operations worked at a very young age. And then as, as I, you know, got out of my undergrad and went on to my first professional job, I, I really went into really a, a, an accounting and, and finance um, um, area um, and, and working for Del Monte Foods. And I, I think my interest at that time was really just to understand how, you know, the guts of a business work. Um, and, and sort of looking back on it, I, I think what I liked about it is it, it worked to, finance helped me to work across the entity. And then stepping back further to the study of managerial economics. So for those of you that are interested, uh, that are familiar with it, um, it it's, it's really um, a study of solving complex problems and, and methods in which you drive decision making to optimize the firm. So in, in many ways, there, there are a number of just supply chain type of attributes that, that connect for there. I didn't know it at the time, but looking back on it and, and having a, a genuine interest in that study, I think that managerial economics uh, was helping me to see across an organization and then finance was helping me at, at a very um, early stage in my career navigate across an organization. And what's, what's been great about um, what I found about supply chain as I got further in, into my career is not only um, could, could I impact the, the dollars moving around, but I was able to better connect that to units and relationships and contracts and data as, as you work your cross, across your, your own organization, but also, um, you know, delivering value to, to customers as well as suppliers. So I, I would say um, I ended up in supply chain by, by accident, but what, what sort of held true for me is I, I like to um, look across a, a, a business and, and look at it from a fairly high level and the, the supply chain um, perspective was was a really big enabler uh, for me to to you know I guess uh, live live that that passion and, and make it a, a reality for um, how I I might contribute to you know any business. So I don't know if that was uh, helpful or not, but. That's how I ended up in supply chain, and and I, I think you know again what held true is is uh, delivering value, especially if it is agriculture related, and uh, a fascination with things being converted into something else that consumers will buy. So supply chain scratched that itch for me, and um, super passionate about it. Definitely. That's exactly what I teach students on the first day. So I say operations, you basically convert input into output, you deliver value to customers. So, so it sounds like oh, we're in the same, same industry. So Peter, I feel like you are more on the strategy level. So do you characterize yourself on operations and supply chain? Yeah, I've had an interesting background, to say the least. But uh, I was a fellow undergrad Aggie, just like Damien. Uh, oh. And then I joined the Marine Corps. And I uh, became a Marine Corps officer. Whoa. Uh, went to uh, Navy Marine Corps Jet Aviation Flight School. Um, so flew jets for a while, became a mission commander, actually ran missions uh, in the jet. Was also uh, director of operations equivalent for a 240 Marine 7 jet squadron with 500 million assets. So I helped. Uh, CEO and the COO uh, run the company. Uh, and then I also did a uh, parlay in uh, the infantry uh, world and I was a joint terminal air controller. If anybody doesn't know what that is, just look it up. Um, essentially, essentially control uh, cast closer support aviation assets above you uh, and support uh, the infantry battalion that you're attached to. So I've had a different operations perspective. It's highly dynamic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are with military people all the time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uncertain environments. Uh, 
And then uh, my wife and I decided that uh, it was time to do something else. And I uh, went back to uh, Davis for the MBA. And they have a special yellow ribbon program uh, where if the MGI bill doesn't cover it, then the university will uh, cover the rest. And uh, so that was a huge incentive for me to go to Davis. Uh, I learned a lot. You know, I took your course, so. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so how did I get into operations? Well, I was already in the operations in, in, the, in, in the military. And so that's, that translates to uh, companies as well. Um, but I did start out uh, at Wells Fargo for my MBA summer associate. And I helped senior bankers underwrite uh, food and beverage companies. And then I immediately followed on to a innovation project with the GSM for Mars Foods. And I came more uh, ingrained into the food and beverage uh, uh, industry. Uh, and then I uh, happened to run into a serial entrepreneur named John Sebastiani right after he sold Crave uh, to Hershey for a quarter billion dollars. And he simply asked the question, you know, hey, do you want to be a part of this? <laughs> Sonoma Brands. I don't know if, you, if anybody doesn't know what Sonoma Brands is, it's a private equity firm which invests in emerging brands and also helps advise uh, companies. And so there was, we didn't even have an office. We just had a brand, Sonoma Brands, and I was the third employee uh, hired on that company. And uh, now we are, I mean, we started Smashmallow, which is a hit, um, and we have invested in companies like Vianta Winery. We bought back Crave Jerky. Has anybody heard of Christina Tossi and Milk Bar? Uh, we're a huge investor in that. Gaiake Herbe Mate. Has anybody seen the yellow can at the C stores? Uh, we invest in that. Hugh Chocolate, which is a vegan chocolate company. True Botanicals, which is a non-toxic skincare company. Dang Foods, uh, which is an organic rice uh, chip company. Uh, and that's just uh, to name a few. So we're, we're all over the place. Uh, we're on our third fund. And uh, we're close to closing a, our third fund for $120 million. So it's been a, a wild ride. And throughout the process, I started out on the investment side. I did the due diligence on Dang Foods, our first portfolio investment. But as the company grew, if anybody's ever been part of a startup, you start to get pulled into different directions. And so I had a knack for operations and, and I continually got pulled into the operations uh, part of our businesses uh, to the point where now I'm head of ops at Smash Mallow. So we, you know, we've come a long way. We still got a long way to go, uh, but we continue to grow every day. Great. Sounds like you, both of you are kind of know several aspects of the business and then uh, and then it's not like you specialize in in supply chain or operations, you pretty much know uh, multiple aspects. And then it, you're just right now in this position of managing operations. Operations is part of what you are managing right now, I feel. Correct. Right? You also, you, you need to know how to motivate people, how to do finance, all, all of those kind of things. Correct. So we have, we have several questions actually coming in and then we want to follow the rule of first come, first serve. Basically, whoever uh, type faster gets their question answered first. So um, there's, the first question says, for wine industry, how are strategies being adjusted to make up for the tanking of um, the on-premise uh, uh, demand? Assuming the demand will take some time to come back to uh, pre-COVID-19 levels, how do you divert those resources to other channels? Does it include rebranding? So that I guess that's for Damien. Yes, I, I think um, good questions, and I, I would say, um, yes, you, you do have to reallocate resources in an effort to, um, you know, uh, push those resources to, to areas that um, are, are willing to have uh, conversations about sales opportunities. So, it, you know, um, I think that the on-premise channel is starting to slowly open back up, but yeah, there, there was literally a, you know, 60-day period where um, if, if your sole focus was on premise, you, you don't necessarily have much to do. So um, I, I'd say in the early days, we were trying to get a read on it 
and we focused on training and, and the team uh, really being on the same page and, and poised for when things open back up. But eventually, um, in, in many areas, similar to what I had mentioned with the tasting room, we started to redeploy resources in, in an effort to, you know, double down in, in areas that we, we were seeing, um, you know, lively growth in the business. Okay, thank you. So, so it sounds like you quickly adjust, readjust your resources to the changes. Yeah, and to address the rebranding, I, I don't know that we're really there yet. So, um, in, in my opinion, we, we've not um, sort of taken a rebranding position, although we've um, tried to proactively identify some, some of our brands that could be a fit for some of the emerging um, channels that, that were mentioned in our conversation earlier. I see. Thank you. So I hope that addressed the question. So uh, Rajat has a question um, to both of you. Do you think there are any specific technical skills or programming languages or anything else that can be helpful for an MBA graduate to have if you target to pursue a career in operations supply chain? So I think he's asking for, do you, do you uh, look for specific uh, you know, technical data analysis? For example, like big data is very popular nowadays. Do you feel big data or any uh, uh, like uh, Python kind of uh, programming language will be be very, very important for MBAs to be um, uh, pursue a career in operations. So I, I'll go with uh, um, Peter on this one. You need to unmute yourself, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, those those programs are helpful, but they're not they're not necessary uh, to to gain access to a, to a job. And every company has different methods of analyzing data. Um, the key points in, in the, the, the trait that we're looking for is, can you find meaning in that data? Uh, can you find patterns that, that, that will help the company make better decisions? Whether it be analyzing where to throw a 3PL or distribution center, uh, depending on your inbound, your outbound, your demand, or you know, where you, you're, you're shipping your materials, uh, to optimization of the plant, uh, to op optimization of, of the ordering process. Uh, you name it, uh, we use data and we, we analyze it in different ways. And if you're able to do that successfully and gain insights uh, that other people don't have, you'll be a step up. And one of the biggest points I wanna make uh, to that uh, is a lesson in life, is that if you just have an opinion that's not supported by uh, data uh, then it's just an opinion. So for all those, all those uh, MBA students out there, just understand when you, when you come to the company, you have to back up your opinions or your strategy with, with data or no one's going to listen to you. <laughs> they might, but. Okay, Damien, what do you think? If someone come to you with an opinion without data, what do you think? <laughs> Well, I, I think that, are, uh, you know, I agree with Peter, um, but I would say that there are times where you may not even have time for data and you may have to make a decision and at a later point have the data and figure out how sound that decision was. So, um, you know, for sure, I, I think um, any time that you can buy time and, and be deliberate, uh, that's, that's the way to go and it does take discipline. Uh, but to, to get back to the, the question here, yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm not qualified to answer the question because I don't know anything about programming languages. But what I would say here is, is you know, uh, between Peter and I, what, what we've described and what we've experienced is, is pretty uh, diverse backgrounds. And so we've, we've each done a bunch of different things. Uh, we've been willing to move laterally, uh, you know, through our career. And there's been an intellectual uh, curiosity there. So, hey, look, if you know a programming language, uh, data, to Peter's point, is going to continue to be critically important to any organization. Uh, what I would say is don't be married to whatever language that is or approach it is, but, but um, what you can bring to the party, um, aside from those very specific you know, language skills, is, is, yeah, what do you do with the data? 
and then and then also just having the skill of being able to structure it, you know, because uh, big data is is really not big data unless you you have the the right infrastructure and, and hierarchy behind it. So just knowing sort of how to build that properly and scale it um, uh, across uh, you know the entity and and across potentially multiple entities, that's that's a skill that employers are going to be interested in. So um, bring that and and bring all of your other experiences, but. You know, I, I would say that um, I'm looking for diversity and and experiences and skill sets, and that's that's an interesting one. So keep going that direction. Yeah, right, that's 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 right, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I said absolutely right, Damian. Well said. Yeah, we have, we are reached very good agreement here. So it seems like everyone. I think the key here is that we need to make sense out of the data. I mean, having data itself is not very helpful. So it needs to make the connected dots and eventually there is a message out of the data. Otherwise, the data is just the data. It's like raw material, right? So, um, so I guess that's the answer. I hope, Rajat, that answer is, is good for you. Um, the next question actually uh, is a question for Peter. So Ayumi was asking, you had mentioned that you are looking for a candidate who is strong in analytics. Would you mind elaborating on what that means and how a candidate would demonstrate that? So that's like, uh, Peter, I mean, you, you, did you mention like you want to, uh, for employees, you are looking at them very strong in analytics? Yeah, very, very, very uh, strong in analytics. Uh, obviously, they have to be able to do uh, a lot of things as, as uh, Damien was mentioning, not just uh, crunch data, but if if you're able if you're able to understand the data, find trends, connect the dots, like you were saying, and then present it in a way that people can understand, and then form a basis of a decision that can move the company forward, then you are extremely valuable extremely valuable. And if you add on top of that, the attitude part that I was talking about, I mean, you have the potential of becoming, you know, a senior leader in an organization. Okay, so, oh, so Damien, that answers the question. Yeah, Damien, you have any comment about like, do you prefer someone have very strong analytics to uh, bring, bring something? It, it, I guess it's like ability to see something we're not able to see before. If someone who is very strong with analytics, they can see something more through the data and that can bring uh, better decisions for the organization. That's very uh, well, that's where, that will be very well received, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, Peter said it best and I would just add that um, knowing your, your why is, is really important um, because what, what can be frustrating from my perspective at times is you have um, an individual that is, is very talented when it comes to data analytics and manipulation and all that, but um, the, the, the skill of, of delivering the goods and, and understanding why you're doing the analysis in the first place, it, it's critical. And I, I think that's kind of what uh, Peter's also touching on is, is if you, you understand what the end game is and you're able to, um, you know, walk other senior leaders and, and stakeholders, um, um, you know, over that bridge, that's, that's a huge value add. Uh, so it's, it's not enough to just know how to manipulate data and do cool analytics. That, that's simply just not going to hit the mark. You, you have to understand uh, why am I doing this and, and what decision am I trying to help the organization make. Thank you. Yeah, make uh, basically uh, there will be uh, some implications from the data analyzed. So there's another question for Peter. So someone asked, uh, saying, you mentioned that being in a full cash position will be detrimental for companies in 2021. Why do you think this? And can you explain this in more detail? Is 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 it that the company will lose value even though they have the same amount of cash? What is the strategy for overcoming this in your mind? So this is related to yeah. Let me let me clarify that point. So in 2020, right now in this condition, if you are running out of cash and you need to fundraise, 
this is probably the worst time in the last decade to, to, to raise money. Uh, and the, the conditions are scarce for the private equity firms that will lend money. Uh, banks won't lend money in this time because it's too risky, especially for a startup uh, company that is finding its way uh, on a you know, three-year, two-year, three-year path to positive EBITDA. Uh, the private equity firms to invest in this time frame need to exact a, a concession that is worth the risk that they're undertaking. Private equity investments is, is risky already, but right now is an even riskier time. So you'll see a large portion of private equity firms pull back from the risk and only invest if it's a, a superior deal under superior, I mean, uh, inferior circumstances. And so what that means is either you get less money for more equity uh, or you, you can't fundraise, you can't find somebody to, to invest in you. So you have to have a, a proposition that makes sense that's less risky, uh, and that's very hard to do if you're in a cash poor scenario in 2020. Now, 2021, uh, when the economy uh, shown significant rebound and, and better patterns, uh, then there'll be a, a completely different fundraising scenario. So startup companies, small companies, medium-sized companies who are growth companies need to make it to 2021. So it sounds like it's because of the uh, general the general economic environment that the PEs are very, very cautious with venture capitals are very very cautious with their money. So that's why cash will be quite quite important. It, it's because of the uh, category your business is in because you so, so Sonoma brand is more in the uh, PE and the venture capital um, category, right? Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here's another question. <laughs> so I um and. So, and Alicia asked you, if you can go back to your time at a GSM, are there any classes you wish you could have taken or wish you could have offered, uh, they could have offered, offered that would make you more prepared for your career? So, um, so you need to recall the days that you spent in GSM. Is there any classes that you regret not taking? Or you, you, you hope that like we offered some classes at that time that could help you prepare you better? I yeah, I mean, I would, have took, I would have took Professor Chen's class twice if I could have. I, no, I just, uh, you know, look, I, I think it's, it's different for everyone, uh, right? Because you come, you come to the GSM and we all have the experiences that we've had up to that point. So, I think um, if I could go back in time um, and, you know, had this time machine all of a sudden, I, I would spend, um, I doubled down on the time that I spent with, with professors and, and uh, you, you know, students, um, sort, of, sort of the peer group, because I, I think, man, you, you, it's just a great opportunity to learn from one another. And I would also um, suggest and I, I think I took this path, but I, I feel good uh, about the fact that I did, is I didn't always take classes that I was super interested in or I thought might be easy for me. So um, I like math, so business writing makes me dry heave, yet I took the class at the Graduate School of Management because um, I knew that it, it would make me a better professional at the end of the day. And so really discipline yourself to take those classes that you kind of don't want to take and you're not super familiar with maybe some of those areas. So, you know, if you're, if you're not in marketing and don't ever want to be in marketing, um, you know, take the class and, and maybe it, it'll, it'll shift your mindset. Um, one class that I would say had a, a really big impact on me because it kind of completed the business cycle was Robert Yetman's um, tax class. Um, you, you know, you've heard Peter talk about finance uh, here a lot uh, today and, and how really um, investors look at things and, and how shareholder value is perceived. Well, the business cycle, if you don't take taxes into account in terms of how you evaluate companies or how the deal gets done, um, that's a big miss because it's, it's significant 
So not only knowing those financial reports, knowing the you know fundamentals around accounting and finance, but understanding the tax cycle um, for everyday business as well as uh, deal making, critically important. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, at the MBA, uh, I, I believe the definition of success at the MBA is to have a panoply of experiences, right? Gain, gain as much experience of, uh, about business in all different uh, segments of the company so you, become, you can become a better manager. You know what to expect out of a marketer or you know what you don't know uh, to hire somebody that your skill set needs to be offset by. I know I work uh, very closely with VP of marketing, VP of sales, CFO, CEO, uh, you know, so it's, you have to be able to understand each other. If you're able to communicate and try to get, uh, solve problems, you have to understand how their perspective, how they're coming from, and how they're viewing problems. Uh, and so the MBA allows you to do that. So if you're just going to focus on finance or ops, I recommend taking marketing classes. Uh, I wish the GSM had a, 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 a sales class. Uh, that's the one, the one thing that, that, that you know, I would be deficient on is is the the art of the sale or or strategy behind uh, selling your product to companies. What you know, what, what are the best methods to do so? Uh, so that's a that's a point. I, I just want to put one shout out uh, the negotiation class by uh, Jim Olson. Yeah, Olson. That is one of the the, the best class besides your class, uh, Professor Chen. <laughs> Thanks. So the, so polite. the best classes I've ta I've taken at the GSM, and the reason why I say that is because it was so practical. And I just want all the students here to understand: when you go into your businesses and and you start to become senior leaders, you have to be prepared. It, it, I mean, every time you pick up a phone call, it's sort of a negotiation. It's fact finding figuring out what the other uh, company's position is, whether it's your partner, whether you have to do force majeure, whatever it is, uh, it's, it's fact finding and, and find, trying to find you, the, the alignment of interest and put yourself in the best position possible. And if you're not prepared and you uh, pick up a phone call with a potential supplier and you don't know uh, what your target price is, Etc. I'm just giving you, you uh, an example. You are doing your company a disservice. So you need to be prepared. You need to try to predict their position, what their BATNA is, what your position, what your BATNA is, and and try to predict a outcome before you even pick up the phone, uh, or you'll waste tons of your investors' money. And so I highly recommend taking that class. So so thank you so much. I. Uh, it's unfortunate we are uh, at 6.30, so I heard from you that the uh, fantastic classes that you have taken. So I received this, uh, we received several messages from students and, and our colleagues saying thank you both of you so much for spending your time with us. I know you guys are fighting with COVID-19 and probably with some of the uh, recent challenges uh, due to like curfew or whatever, uh, and you are generous with your time. And you are generous with your insights. You share everything uh, you have with us. So we are very, very grateful. So um, thank you so much for um, you know, coming back. And we should have this more often, I feel like. I mean, it's so great to see um, alumni uh, coming back and contribute to GSM and uh, see each other again and reflect on the experience that you have uh, you know, with the faculty and also the classmates here. Yeah.